Thank you. Well, today we're going to be uh, uh, in our second week of our new series, Life After the Alarm Clock. And I want to invite you to turn, open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Um, and as we, as we start to divide the room a little bit. So where are, where are my night owls at? Where are my night owls at? Yeah, some of you were just now walking in. Yeah, I get it. So, my night owls, man, the life of the party, you stay up late. You know, 11 o'clock is an early bedtime for you night owls, right? Um, and there's just so much that's happening in your life and you stay up. Where are my morning people at? Come on, come on. You guys have been up for five hours now. It's about lunchtime, okay? That's right. Isn't it funny? Isn't it funny how we can easily categorize our life based upon our preference of time that we wake up in the morning? Am I right? Am I right? Have you ever, I don't know how marriages work whenever there's a, a night owl and, and a morning person, right? It's, it's so fascinating how we easily are able to slip into those, slip into those categories. What about, what about people? Where's my doers at? Where's my people? You just always got to be busy. You just always got to have something going on. You've got 14 projects and it's tough to pay attention right now because they're sitting there at home waiting, right? You know what you're doing. Where, where are my free spirits at? You're just like, yeah, I'm here, all right? <laughs> I was talking with my sister yesterday, and she was talking about a vacation. And she's going to wake up at 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning and eat breakfast and go lay by the pool and hang out. And then after she, she does that work, she's going to go back to her hotel room and nap, right? And then get up and for dinner and then do nothing else the rest of the day until she goes to sleep. And I went, that sounds terrible. That sounds, sounds awful. Like even, even if my kids weren't running around, that sounds terrible. I'm a doer. i got to do things, right? Who in here, that just sounds like a beautiful vacation. You're like, yeah, sign me up. That's right. I, I think it's easy how we categorize ourselves into these different sections based upon our personal preferences. But have you ever thought about how we spend our lives, how we spend our time? I, I, it, it confuses me how some people choose to spend their time. You ever, you ever ask them, like, I, I don't even get where you see the joy in that, Right? I was listening to a podcast the other day, and there was a lady who was talking on this podcast. She, she's famous, I guess. I'd never heard of her. Um, but she was talking on this podcast, and she was talking about one of the biggest moments in her life um, that, that she had the opportunity to speak at her college commencement, right? She had the opportunity as a student to give the college commencement speech. And, and I didn't know this, but I wasn't close. I always thought the valid Victorian just got that honor, but she was saying, no, I wouldn't know. They never asked me to give that speech, right? But, the, but the, she, she went up, and there was like 20 people that, were, that had signed up that they had asked to potentially give this speech, and she had to walk into a room of, of staff and faculties and teachers and, and be able to talk about what, what she would say if she were chosen to give the commencement speech. So she put hours of work into this, what she was going to talk about, trying to strike the perfect balance of, of humor and inspiration and, and, and heartfeltness. And she went in and they said, all right, we'll, we'll call you in a few weeks. A few weeks went by. Her phone rang and she picked it up. Like, hello? They said, hello, this is such and such for the, from the faculty from the school. And we were calling about college commencement speech. And we, we regret to inform you that you're not going to be giving the college commencement speech. But, but we want you to be the understudy. We want you to be the backup. You, you, were, you were so close, but we have went with another person to give the commencement speech. But in the event that, that that person cannot do it, we want you to be ready at a moment's notice, even the day of, to, to give that speech. And so she she agreed to it and she practiced and she went back and she wrote down and she, she practiced the names of her professors and how to say, how to say them. She, she practiced uh, what she was going to say and where everything flowed in the sentence, in the speech. And the day of the commencement speech came, graduation was here. And she never got to give that speech. The person they initially went with continued to give the speech they didn't get sick. I don't know if you're supposed to pray for someone to get sick at that point, but I'm sure there was some disappointment there that she wanted to be able to deliver this speech that she had worked so hard on. Have you ever given a whole lot of effort and there was no payoff at the end? You've given the effort, you put in the time, you put in the effort, you put in the energy, but then there was no payoff at the end. See, we're going to be in 
1 Corinthians chapter 3 today. And in chapter 3, um, in 1 Corinthians, this is, this is the letter that Paul is writing to a church. And, and there was a lot of problems in the church, but one of the biggest problems with the, was, with the church was unity. Right, this idea that they were all uh, they were all stretched out, they were all divided uh, amongst themselves within the local church. In First Corinthians one, he he talks about this. He says, "For it has been reported to me by Chloe. I don't know who Chloe is, but she's got people, right? It has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers." What I mean is that each of you says, "I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, who is Peter." Some of you are looking down like, you said chapter 3. Yeah, this is just the prelude, right? This is just chapter 1. This is setting everything up. And this this idea of this quarreling came up, and it continues to be an issue amongst the church. And so this is what he's writing his letter to address in the first four four chapters. He's dealing with this strife, this interpersonal preference um, that they are having through the first chapters. And, And it even says, for a while there was jealousy and strife among you, are you not flesh behaving only as humans do? For it says, when, for one of you says, I follow Paul. One of you says, I follow Apollos. Aren't you merely humans? Isn't that, isn't that your humanity coming out at that point? You see, today, I, I, if, if you don't hear anything else, if you're tuning out, if you've got all those things on your mind, I want you to hear this, all right? I want you to hear this. God blesses obedience. God blesses obedience obedience, right? God wants to bless the one thing that he can't possess, and that is our obedience. God cannot possess, uh, he gave us free will, he cannot possess what we choose to do, right? He has no control over it, he's given us that free will to be able to act in accordance to how we see best, but God wants to bless our obedience. Last week, we we read through uh, the book of Exodus how God's people had fallen in love with the gift and not the giver. They had fallen in love with the promised land and not the promise keeper, not the promise maker, not the one who promised. And today, roughly 1,500 years after Moses, Paul is dealing with his church on a very similar issue. The people, the church, the body of believers They were concerned more with their own personal preferences, with their style preferences, rather than with the Savior's purpose. Rather than being united in what God has given them, in what God has called them to do. They wanted to talk about these preferences. And so we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Oh, hey, how's it going? (laughs) Oh, well. (laughs) She's just trying to bring me a snack. I know. I would have could have used it right then. But we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and, and we're going to start in verse 5, and it says this. Paul asked the question. Remember, he's, remember, these people are all against each other, and he says, what is Apollos? What is Paul? That's where he starts. This is an incendiary question to ask, Right? This is like Donald Trump or Joe Biden at Thanksgiving meal, right? You know, he's just like throwing it out there to see what happens, right? You know people got opinions about it, and people are going to be all over the board on it, right? And he starts off this with with this question, what is Apollos? What is Paul? Now, notice he doesn't say, who is Apollos? Who is Paul, right? Right? He's trying to stir up some emotion here, but he does it very, very cleverly. He says, what are they? See, who implies relationship? What implies occupation? Who is that? That's Steve. What is Steve? Steve plays the saxophone up here, guys. Come on. (laughs) Right? That's the who and the what, the occupation. And so who, who it is, isn't what Paul's asking. Paul's asking, what is Paul? What is Apollos? And what he answers is this. What is Paul? What is Apollos? Servants through whom you believed. As the Lord assigned to each, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor, for we are God's fellow workers." So Paul wants to make one thing extremely clear here in this passage, that there's only one who that matters. 
There's only one who, and I don't want to give it away, but his name starts with a J and it ends with an Jesus, all right? All right, there's only one person here that matters, only one who, one relationship that matters, and that is that of Jesus Christ. But he says, what are Paul and what are Apollos? They're servants. Now, the Greek word, which I'm not a scholar in Greek, but I can read some stuff, right? The Greek word is dikonos, dikonos. Two words make up this word, and the first word is dia, which means thoroughly, and then the second part of the word is konos, konos, which means dust. And it actually means, the proper meaning is to kick up dust, dust running an errand. To kick up dust in haste as you're on a mission for ministry. Someone who is performing a time-sensitive task for another, on the behalf of another. See, Paul wants to be clear that the only who that matters is the one that they're serving, the one that they're kicking up dust for, the one that they're kicking rocks for, right? Kick rocks, kid. Yes, sir. This is who they, this is what they are. They are servants. What they do is in the hands of who they serve. And they act quickly. And they act in a time-sensitive manner. Have you ever had a time-sensitive something come up? Any of you guys ever had been, you had a time-sensitive thing come up, bills coming up, you know, you've got to get to the doctor at this time, school, you know, all of these things, these time-sensitive things that come up, it can be a bit overwhelming. The due dates at work, getting kids picked up from the daycare, reminders, kind of ridiculous. There are so many things vying for our time that when we wake up in the morning, there's just so many things that are trying to get to us, so many things that we have time-sensitive issues that, that are urgent, that, that require our attention. It can be very overwhelming. So we set alarms so we don't forget. Anybody set alarms? Got alarms going off on your phone all the time? You're like, oh, shoot, I don't even remember what that one was for, right? I mean, in fact, I think we've gotten so used to it a little bit that this is how we interact that we kind of even wear time as a fashion statement, right? It's like, oh, hang on, let me check my phone. I've got something way more important going on, right? It's easy for us to wear time as a fashion statement. I mean, Flava Flav did it, right? <laughs> Flava Flav, he's got, the, he's, got the, he's got the chain with the clock on it. They, they asked Flava Flav, um... I don't know if it's flavor or flavor. I'm trying to be cool here. I don't know if I'm succeeding or not. But, but they, they asked and they said, the reason, they asked and they said, why do you wear this clock? He wore it all the time. So why do you wear this clock? And he said, the reason why I wear this clock is because it represents time being the most important element of our life. It represents time being the most important element of our life. And we, we wear it as a fashion piece. I, I think we embody it a lot of times. We, in fact, just a second. I wanted to, wanted to do my best right there. We wear it as a fashion statement. We've got, we, listen, time is important, man. This is, this is where I'm at. This is what I'm doing. We get the necklace. We talk about it. We look cool. We look cool. Sorry, I'm busy. I can't commit to things right now. I might have other things going on. My gold-plated clock, it, it's calling my name. I wear it around my neck just to make sure that I remember that time is important. My alarms are going off on my phone just as a reminder that I've got things to do. I've got stuff going on. Our pagers are reminders, everything that's going on, and we, we end up wearing it as a fashion piece. It kind of creates us. It kind of gives us purpose, who we are. We have our times that we have to be certain places, right? See, physicists define time as the progression of events from past to present to future, that's what time is. It, it, it's, it's a way for us to track events from past to present to future. Basically, if a system it goes unchanged, it is timeless. It, it, the styles that you might wear, the ones that never go out of fashion, what are they? They're timeless. And as we sit here with our, with our time around our neck, it is just a way, it is a metric that we use to simply track time. It's a tool, it's an instrument, just like, just like a compass or just like a measuring cup. It's a way that we can track the time that is passing by so we can intelligently talk about it. And it, it all matters how we use the instrument, right? It matters how we use the tool. 
I mean, some of us are slaves to time. Am I right? Some of us, like, we legit have a chain around us, and we have to be here. You ever been with a person on vacation who has to be everywhere at a certain time? You're slaves to time. You've got your schedules planned out. You've got everybody's schedule planned out. You've got an entire wall of schedules planned out, so everyone can be there at the same time. Anybody? Don't, don't be nudging somebody. I see you out there. Some of us, it doesn't matter if you have this clock around your neck. You ain't going to be on time at all. Like, it doesn't even matter. It doesn't even matter. Am I right? Because this clock is the tool that we use to represent time. The clock is simply a tool we use to navigate the space, much like the compass, much like any other tool, right? It's just a tool. And in the right hands, it can be very powerful. And in the wrong hands, it can be very destructive. See, a tool is only as powerful as the one who holds it. I don't care who you are, if you put a hammer in Stan's hand, some good things are going to happen. If you put a hammer in one of my kids' hands, some very not good things are going to happen. It all matters in who's the one holding the tool. Who's the one running the errand? The tool is only as powerful as the one who holds it. And that clock is a way that we measure time. Because we see time as linear. That second that just passed, we're not getting it back. That second that just passed, we're not getting it back. We experience time on this linear equation. And so time is money. Or, or well, we got all the time in the world. However we're doing it, we, we're not getting it back. It is a tool. So the question is, how do we use it? In Acts chapter 9, We're going to flip over a little bit. You don't have to flip there. It's going to be up on the screen. But in Acts chapter 9, there was a man by the name of Ananias that God wanted to have a conversation with. And he shows up. He says, hey, Ananias, let's chat. And the Lord said to him, raise up and go to Straight Street. Go to the street called Straight. And at that house of Judas, look for a man from Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen a vision of a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. For he has chosen, for he is chosen, in verse 15, for he is chosen, a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. Did you catch it? God had already given Saul a vision of what he hadn't yet asked Ananias to do. God had already given Saul a vision of what he had not, of what Ananias had not yet agreed to. That's backwards. Supposed to ask Ananias, and then Ananias agreed, Saul, here's what's going down. But his vision of time, his perception of time is very different than ours. So in verse 17, it says this, so Ananias departed and entered the house. Ananias departed. Ananias became a servant. Ananias kicked rocks and left and went upon God's business. And he entered the house. He obeyed what God told him to do. And laying hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. This man Saul had an encounter with God that left him blind, and and he went out for, for days waiting, feeling this blindness, feeling the presence of God, and Ananias now shows up and heals him. Ananias knew this. And so when Saul, when he showed up, he understand that the only who that mattered in that relationship, the only who that mattered in that story was Jesus. The Lord Jesus who appeared to you has sent me. Ananias knew that when he showed up, it was, it was, with Saul, it was God is the one who was getting the credit. He was only being an obedient servant to what God had asked him to do. Even though the timing, ooh, even though the timing didn't matter, even though the timing didn't make sense. Have you ever, have you ever thought about this? Have you ever wondered why God used Ananias? Have you ever thought about why God used Ananias to heal him? I mean, God struck him blind. God struck Saul blind with a bright light. Could have snapped his fingers. I mean, honestly, it was inefficient. (laughs) 
Using Ananias, God showing up in another place and saying, hey, I want you to go over and do this stuff. God could have just fixed it. God could have just done the thing that, that he wanted done. But God chose to use a servant. God chose to use a believer. God chose to use a follower to enact his will on this earth. When it might have been more efficient to do it another way, when it might have been something, when, when you could have thought of a thousand different reasons, when you could have thought, well, it didn't make sense in the timeline, God chose to use a servant to enact his will here on earth. See, I want us to remember something, that I serve a God who works outside of my, my vision of time. God, I serve a God who works outside of my understanding of time. God has a different understanding of time than we do. And we serve a God that isn't constrained by the same seconds that tick off this clock. He doesn't measure time the exact same way that we do. He has chosen us. Catch this. He has chosen us, his church, with all of our flaws, with all of our constraints. He has chosen us to plant and water and use our efforts to bless this world. He's chosen to use our obedience to bless this world. He didn't need Ananias' hands. Ananias was just a common dude. He was no skilled eye doctor or optometrist. I think that's an eye doctor, right? Optometrist? Yeah. He, he, he was just a dude. He just walked up, puts his hands on his eyes like, Meh. but God chose to use him, his obedience to enact his will here on earth. See, acting in obedience is our purpose. Acting in obedience is our purpose purpose there, there's there's two kinds of of people and paul starts talking about this idea of community right he doesn't want there to be strife within the church you know what the difference between friends and community are friends have a common interest community has a common purpose Friends have a common interest, community has a, has, has, a, has a common purpose, and when we as a community, when we as believers get together and say, hey, our job, our purpose is to be obedient to Christ, the time doesn't matter, How, what we think, our efficiency doesn't matter, this is what it is, we have a common purpose, and that is to obey, that is to kick rocks for Jesus, that is to get busy, to get active, to take his message to the world. You see, not everyone is called to preach, but each of us are called to reach, each of us are called to go out into the world and to plant and to water and to harvest. And God is responsible for the growth. Remember he said that? We are responsible to plant and to water and God is responsible to grow. The only who that matters here is God. And all we have to do is go into the world and be obedient to what he calls us to do even if it's not on our time. He simply uses our obedience in a way to measure the progression from the past to the present and into the future. Our obedience is how God measures time because he can use it in a way that is outside our understanding. See, a clock, this clock, it has hands that inform us. What time is it? What time is it? Some of you guys are like analog clocks, I don't know. Like, uh, there's a big hand and a little hand. That one that moves around fast gets me confused. Ah. Uh, See, this clock right here, you all knew what time it was because this clock informs you. A clock's hands inform us, but it's Christ's hands that hold us. It's Christ's hands that hold us and give us that opportunity to join him, to give us that opportunity to join him as fellow workers to bring his kingdom here on earth through our obedience. We, were, we are as powerful as the hands that hold us. We're as powerful as the hands that hold us. So whenever we give our obedience to God and we allow God to hold us, time, this time, it's not anything that we have to worry about. All we have to do is be obedient because we are part of something way bigger. We are part of something way bigger. We are here to consider ourselves the sower of the seed. God says do something and we kick rocks and we move with haste. We kick up dust so we are able to enact God's will here on earth being obedient. We consider ourselves the sower of the seeds, like the farmer who sows the seeds for the crop, right? Because if, if the farmer who sows, right, if they are supposed to sow the seeds, and you come along and water, but the farmer didn't sow, guess what you're watering? Nothing. 
It's measured in obedience. This time is measured in obedience. Obedience to do the work that God has called us to do. To live in unity and be obedient to that of Christ. He uses our obedience to bring about his will. See, Paul says this in the passage. He says, we are servants through whom you believed. Not in whom you believed. I think a lot of times we, we mix up the through and the in. It's easy for us to mix up the through and the in. Through whom you believed. And when we sit there and say, well, it's in whom we believe. Paul wants to make it very clear that he has a clock just like you. He experiences time just like you. And it's not in this. It's not in him that they believe. It's not in their preferences. It's not in, well, I like that guy. I don't like that guy. It's through whom we believe in Christ. If we are obedient to Christ, then our lives are going to matter. Because the burden of effectiveness and fruitfulness doesn't rely on us. It relies on the one who sent us. The, one, the message that we're carrying. Our obedience is never in vain because God operates operates outside of our understanding of time. But what happens if it takes too long? You ever, you ever done something? You ever put the work in and didn't get the payoff? I think that's some of the most frustrating things that can happen is we've put the time in. We've done everything right. We've spent the minutes doing the right things and we've planted the seeds and we've watered and we just feel like, man, there's just nothing. I've been praying for this person for decades. I feel like nothing's happening. I've been putting the work. I've been doing the right things for a long time. I've been sowing the seeds. I've been watering for a long time. And man, it's just discouraging. Proverbs 19, 21 says this, many are the plans in the minds of men, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. We are instruments in God's hands for him to do the work. But the results are still God's and God's alone. So neither he who plants, remember, nor he who waters is anything. It's only God who gives the growth. We have no idea how long our story is. Think about that for a second. We have no idea how long our story is. If you pick up a book or if you're watching a YouTube click, you can get, click down to that buffer button and you can see how much longer you have left on that video, right? You can see the back page of the book. You can see the cover of the book and you know how, much, how long it, it has left. But our lives, we don't know how much longer we have left. And that's not just here on this physical earth, but we have no idea how long the seeds that we plant and the seeds that we're watering, how long it will take to germinate, how long it will take for God to reap the harvest. Remember that, remember that story I told at the beginning of the commencement speech? How funny is it that 20 years after when she became a famous podcaster, they called her back to give a commencement speech at her college? She had put that time in, she had put the work in, and she had no clue that in 20 years from when, you gra from when she graduated college, that they were going to call her back and say, hey, would you be able to give this commencement speech? She had no clue how long her story was going to last. There are some of you guys out here who have been planting and watering for decades, and you get frustrated and you get tired. I just want to see the harvest. I just want to see what God's going to reap from this. I just want to see what it is, but I feel like it's not there. And it's not our job to, to collect the harvest. It's not our job to make it grow. It's our job to be obedient. It's our purpose to be obedient to what Christ calls us to. So we plant and we water and we sow. And we're in the hands of one who operates outside of our vision of time, outside of our time. And it can happen at any point. God can take the things that we do in obedience and decades later, centuries later, use it for his glory. Ananias thought he saw it. Ananias comes over and heals Saul, right? Puts his hands on him. Oh my goodness, what a great opportunity. Saul, we saw a miracle in front of us and that Saul later, spoiler alert, becomes an apostle, kind of a big deal, kind of reading some letters, kind of, kind of wrote a lot of the New Testament, Right? What he planted and what he watered was way bigger. It was way bigger than he could have ever imagined because God, who operates outside of time, used his obedience. So what is our role? What is our purpose? Our purpose is simple. Sow, water, pray. Sow, water, 
pray. As we continue sowing the seeds, as we continue being faithful, moving, kicking rocks for Jesus Christ, as we continue doing that in our work, in our, in our cubicles, at our schools, with our families, as we continue, continue planting those seeds, asking people, well, well how, how are you doing? As we continue loving on people, asking them where they stand with Christ, asking them about what they, what they believe about the Bible, asking them all of these questions, we continue to sow those seeds. And then later we continue to water those seeds. We're in relationship with one another as we're partnering together because if Jerry's doing something, if Jerry's sowing some seeds, maybe later I'm going to come along and encourage somebody to be able to water the seeds that he's planted. And God is going to continue. I don't know why he does it, y'all. We're flawed, right? We, we don't see it the same way. We don't see the time the same way God does, but he chooses to have us be a part of what he's doing. And that, that is the opportunity we have to live in obedience with cr what Christ is calling us to. We get to sow, we get to water, and we get to pray for God to make the growth. What are we? We're servants. I pray, that, uh, my prayer is that, that people don't sit here and look at me, but they sit here and they see who God is. They, 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 they see me as a what, not as a who. Because acting in obedience is our purpose. Our responsibility our responsibility is to sow, water, and pray. So here's what I'm gonna, here's what I'm, I think this is the most exciting news ever, right? I think this is the best news ever because, because that responsibility, that chain, that weight, that sometimes carry, that holds us down, that we put on ourselves, the pressure that we always, see in the back of the clock there, the pressure that we always feel to have on us to what we're chained to in our time, we only have so much time to do this. God's coming back, we, we have to hurry. The, the, the responsibility of growth isn't on us. It's on God. We're responsible to be obedient to what he calls us to do. So I'm gonna invite you to stand and we're gonna sing a praise and worship song as we leave here today and we go out into this world and we live a life of obedience to God that God is going to use for his kingdom purposes. Let's stand.